I was born in 1972. When my dad was in high school, he's an All-American football player. He got a full scholarship to SMU. He got homesick, hurt his knee, so he ended up coming home, getting married, and started working for the Texas Highway Department. He got hit by a semi-truck, but he's such a big guy that he didn't break any bones in his body, but he has pretty severe head damage and was in a coma for about eight weeks. When he came to from the coma, he just had these really crazy fits of rage. Like it took about 12 people to hold him down. Leather strapped him down. And I don't know how much longer he's in the hospital, but it never went away. My mom said the, the guy that went in the hospital was different than the guy that I brought home. If a commercial was too long in the middle of a TV show he was watching, he would throw a couch end over end. He never laid a finger on my mom, but he would break things that were very important to her. And so she eventually left. Hey. Mama? Mama? Where's Mama? She's gone. Gone where? She ran off. She ain't coming back. Just you and me now. When will she be back? I told you she run off. She don't want me no more, and she don't want you neither. Back then, whoever left, it was they were kind of to blame. Family around them kind of were like, you know, we think the boys should stay in the hometown with the rest of the family. They still saw my dad as a stable option. I tend to believe she kind of got bullied into leaving us. At this point, my dad had never been abusive towards me, and so no one really had reason to think that was gonna happen, but the second that she moved away and something changed, and it was a scary childhood, to say the least. The unfortunate part sometimes is we can kind of relate to that maybe in your childhood. Maybe your father wasn't the best in the world. And then what ends up happening is people say, okay, well, you need to come to God and God be your father. And it's like, how do I relate to that? So today we're going to talk about that, okay? Because one of the things that I have found so much is that Many Christians do not understand even the beginning of the relationship that God wants for them. And they, they do it for wrong reasons. And so this morning we want to break it down as to exactly what he's talking about. There's a, there's a small art organization that goes around the country and they go into public schools in some of the roughest areas of cities and towns. And, and what they do is they teach what is called art therapy. Because there's a lot of kids that are in some of these environments that they've never really been able to process their whole environment. And so each day what they do is they bring these kids 
into class. And they asked the kids to begin by closing their eyes because you're going into what is called the imagination station. And there they have no limits. They can close their eyes, they can do and dream anything. There's no stipulations. They can pretend that they're an astronaut. They could pretend that they're this, or they could pretend that they were something else. And what they want to do is give these kids the same opportunities that all of the other kids in the school have for just a few moments to be able to imagine. And it finds out that what's happening is when they do this, it's transforming the kids' world. They're no longer thinking of the worlds as living in poverty in the middle of the ghettos. They're no longer thinking that they're in the poorest part of Appalachia. They're beginning to dream dreams. And they're beginning to flourish as they get later in life. Because imagination is the most powerful tool that we have. It brings us into a whole new life and a whole new story as we begin to break this down. Because what it does, imagination welcomes the impossible. Because so many times we have things happen, we have things occur, and people say, that's impossible, I can't do this, I can't do that. And they stop. Because they feel confined. They're not capable. They don't know how to move past that. And they can't even imagine. And so what happens is, with the imagination welcoming the impossible, we need to understand that we serve a God who wants to do more with us than we can ever, ever imagine. We are so hung up thinking that we are limited in what we can do because we don't get past the imagination. We say, you don't understand, this is reality. This is who I am. And God's saying, no, this isn't who you are. I have got greater dreams for you. I have greater visions for you. Close your eyes for just a moment and imagine what I could do with you and see the impossibilities that you never dreamed could ever, ever happen. Because you need to understand something, that over the next four weeks, what we're gonna do is we're gonna see how Jesus, in his humanity, not in his godliness, but in his humanity, while he walked on this earth, what we're going to do is we're going to imagine more for the world what in, in, his, in his imagination. He imagined more for the world around him and how he shaped a new legacy, a new story, and a new understanding for us for God, of who God is. For them, they just thought God was somewhere way out yonder. That every once in a while would come down in the temple and the smoke would arise and the incense would be, and that was God. And Jesus was trying to tell them, no, you need to understand something. God is more than just one who visits in the temple every so often. God is one who has more for you than just waiting for your prayers in the incense and the smoke to say that everything's okay. He wants to let you know day after day, moment after moment, that I have got dreams for you. Dreams that you could never, ever imagine. But you see, Jesus wanted us to understand this new story, this new legacy, with every single person he met. He didn't single it out and say this story was not for the prostitutes. This story wasn't for the leggers, the, the leggers, the lepers and the beggars. 
It wasn't for the adulterers and all of this thing. Jesus said, I want you to imagine for just a minute, leper, because you can never enter into the temple because you're unclean. Can you imagine for just a moment, the moment that you can be made clean and enter into the temple of God and how much it would be to worship him? Or you that were lame, how could you imagine no longer being carried to the bed, to, to the pool of Bethesda? How would you imagine that you're waiting there for the angels to come down and to stir the waters and you never could go in there but one of these days you're going to be able to walk and get up in that pool yourself this is what Jesus was trying to tell us through God that we could imagine and this is what this is all about today it's imagining about a loving father you see in the first two chapters of the book of Matthew we begin to see the birth of Jesus and then he goes to Egypt with, with you know, because God, God told Joseph, hey, you need to get out of here, man, here, and it's going to try to kill Jesus, and you need to, you need to go, and I'll let you know when it's safe. And so it, and he went and he told Joseph, he says, okay, Joseph, it's safe now. You can come back to Egypt. And Joseph moves into a little place called Nazareth. And our lesson today, this sermon this morning is going into Matthew chapter 3. And when we begin to see chapter 3, now we begin to see Jesus as an adult. We think, okay, well, what happened, man? He, he was a little boy, and now he's an adult. So what happened in there? And, and we don't know. We have one place in the book of Luke which tells us of one incident between the time of Jesus coming back from Nazareth and Jesus starting his ministry. It was a story of a little boy, 12 years of age, who was with his parents, and they had come into Jerusalem on the journey that they would always make. And they were going there. And as they left Jerusalem and going back to their home of Nazareth, they were talking, and there was a caravan, and all of a sudden, Mary and and Joseph look around and they got some other kids and they're looking and they're missing one. You ever imagine that? Did you ever lose your child? Even for just a second? You turn around and you look and all your other children are there and you're looking for someone missing. We did that one time, I think at Walt Disney World, we were there with uh, our children. Uh, Tim and Tom and and we were there on the on the main street watching the parade Charlie was very fascinated with Minnie And so here comes Minnie and Mickey and all of them coming down coming down through there And we're watching the parade and all of a sudden you see this little girl out there trying to get Minnie And you realize where's Charlie? And you realize oh there she is She's trying to get to her You, you know how much your heart beats and jumps it's one thing to lose your child in the grocery store or in the home but to lose your child at Walt Disney World with all of these other people and all these other kids your heart beats and stops your worst nightmares where they at Think about Mary and Joseph when they're looking around and Jesus isn't there. Well, where did we see him last? I don't know. We were back in Jerusalem. I thought you had hold of him. No, that was your turn to watch him. I've been watching him this long all this time. It's your turn, Joseph. You should have kept hold of him. So they retrace their steps and they go back to Jerusalem. And then they come into the temple. We came here, so maybe this is where he's at. And they come in there, and how much were they amazed when they see this little boy sitting there, the temple filled, and he's speaking, and everybody is listening intently to every word that he had to say. Mary knew she had a special child, and so did Joseph. But never in their wildest dreams, I don't believe that they ever thought they would come and watch their 12-year-old son teaching in the middle of the temple and everybody in awe. 
They had seen what he had done. You know, we just talk about all the miracles that Jesus did when he went into his ministry. Mary knew there was something different about that child because even before, when he, when he went to the marriage Cana, she already told them, you need to do what he tells. Whatever he tells you to do, you need to do. She knew there was something special about him. And this is what God is wanting us to know as we begin to find out about Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, let's start into Matthew chapter 3, if you would please. Jesus is now an adult, and he has his cousin, six months older than him, by the name of John the Baptist. John's already started his ministry. He's out there, and he's telling them. He's telling them, and he's preparing the way for Jesus in his ministry. And so John had invited people to imagine he says, listen, I'm only the one to prepare you for the one to come after me. And there's one that's going to come after me that's going to be greater than me. And I want you to get ready for him. And so here we have in Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Here's what John says. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance. But the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I am. I'm not worthy to take off his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. His winnowing shovel in his hand, and he will clear his threshing, threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the shaft he will burn up with fire that never goes out. You see, John, he started having a big following. A lot of people were starting to come after John and everything. And he was going through the desert. Where the, where, and you think about it for a minute because John was out there in the desert. And he wasn't in the big towns. John didn't pick up a big revival tent and come to the corner or the center of Middletown and preach a revival. John didn't pick up a big tent or write a big check and... and, and uh, uh, lease out U.S. Bank Arena or Great American Ballpark to get a great following. John was in the desert and very few people were living in that desert. But John was out there preaching, you need to repent because there's one coming after me who I am not even worthy to loose his, his shoe straps. He's greater than I am. And John began to tell them this message. And he began to remind them. And so here we have Jesus coming on the scene in verse number 13. Look at what it said. And then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized to him. But John tried to stop him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? Jesus, I'm not worthy to baptize you. If anybody should be in this river baptizing, Lord, it's you. You should be the one baptizing. And we never understood this. But there is a verse in here, or there, there's part of this that you need to understand. And it's found in verse number 15. Because there's a word here that you really probably have never, ever understood what it means. Jesus answered him, allow it for now. You go ahead and baptize me. We'll allow it for now. Because this is the way for us to fulfill all 
righteousness. Then John spoke, and then he allowed him to be baptized. When you begin to break down one word in this whole thing, very middle of verse number 15, fulfill all righteousness. Because I don't think, probably not, that you may have never ever had righteousness explained to you in the proper way to only imagine what can happen. Because the word for righteousness in Greek it is a word, it's called, uh, yeah, if I can pronounce this word, it's diayosone, okay? It's spelled D-I, for Jim, D-I-K, a-H-Y-O-S-O-O-N-A-Y. And this word is important because this word helps us to understand of living right or obedient before God. You hear the word righteousness all the time, taught in many different ways. In order to be righteous, you gotta quit your drinking. In order to be righteous, you gotta quit your smoking. In order to be righteous, you gotta quit your cursing. In order to be righteous, you gotta change the way you dress. In order to be righteous, you gotta change the way you act. In order to do, be righteous, you gotta do this and you gotta do that. And the problem is this, they're always putting the righteous in the emphasis on your actions. Somewhat correct, but misunderstanding totally and completely. Because look at what Jesus said. Jesus said, this we must do. Allow it for now because this is the way for us. Talking about him and John to fulfill all righteousness. You tell me where John had to quit his cursing. You tell me where John had to change the way he dressed. He had camel hair. He ate locusts and wild honey. He looked like a wild man out in the wilderness. You think Duck Dynasty, those guys look bad? Honey, they were nothing compared to what John looked like. You want to tell me that Jesus had to change the way he acted, the way he looked, the way he talked, and the way he behaved in order to fulfill all of the righteousness? That's what people tell us. And they are incorrect wrong. Jesus and John didn't change the way they look, the way they act, and the way they talk in order to fulfill the righteousness. Then he allowed him to be baptized. There was something wrong. And so we don't understand what righteousness is all about. Because we need to understand that John didn't fully understand this. And here it comes. Verse 16 and 17 in Matthew chapter 3. After Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens suddenly opened for him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And there came a voice from heaven. This is my beloved Son. I take delight in him. You see, this we see in verse number 16, we begin to see the first glimpse of how Jesus was obedient to God. And it revealed, it revealed God's imagination for Jesus. That's what he was fulfilling, ladies and gentlemen. 
He was fulfilling what God had imagined him to do when God sent him to this earth to become our sacrifice. Jesus was now beginning to start fulfilling the imagination of God. May I understand to you, or give to you what diakonesis means. Righteousness means. It means you and I fulfilling the imagination that God has planned for you and me. Even before the beginning of the earth, I knew you, I created you, I made your thoughts, I put your bones together, I put your muscles together. I had plans for you. I imagined these things for you. Righteousness, ladies and gentlemen, is when we begin to fulfill the imagination of God. Will it change the way you talk? Absolutely. Will it change the way you walk and look? Absolutely. You may still have long hair, but honey, there's something different about your persona. It changes. Why? Because God hasn't imagined a world full of chaos and, and, and clutter and diseases. God has imagined for you and I a place of perfection, a place where we can get away from chaotic world and pain and suffering and everything else. That's God's imagination, ladies and gentlemen, and his living out that fulfillment of his righteousness is what he wants us to do. Amen. Oh, I can only imagine if my eyes could ever see the things that you have made for me, for me, I can only imagine. You see, it was in this very moment when Jesus was baptized and he came up out of here that Jesus became obedient to the baptism that we have three things about the Father's heart for Jesus. Number one, God identified with him. You see, look at what he said. In verse number 17, the very first thing that happened after Jesus came back up out of the water was what? This is another soul that's been baptized. Another wet one. This is my beloved son. Ladies and gentlemen, when you give your life to Jesus, God identifies with you. He says, this is my child. He didn't say, oh, there's another sinner. He says, this is my child. This is what we don't understand. I keep trying to tell you, God is the best partying person I've ever met in my life. Why? Because the Bible says that every time a sinner comes to repentance, that there is, there is joy in the presence of the angels. It didn't say the angels are rejoicing. It says someone is rejoicing in the presence of the angels. And who's in the presence of the angels? God is. Yes, he is. You know how it, it is when y'all graduated from high school, if you made it? Okay, how about preschool? Do you ever remember that point in time in your life when you finally, finally did something? Maybe it was ride a bike, maybe it was cook a meal, something that you were so excited about that, all oh, right, I finally achieved this. What did you do? Well, mom, dad, you wanna be, see how proud you are of me? Look at what I just did. I pulled my first tooth out. No, we got it all wrong. Do you understand what's going on here at this baptism? Think about it for a minute. All of these people are gathered around to be baptized and John's talking to them about repentance and righteousness 
And they're waiting to get into the water for John to go ahead and baptize them and then bring them back up. And then all of a sudden, they're interrupted. Here's this guy coming down through here, and John says, Hey, remember that one that I told you that I couldn't, I couldn't untie his sandals? That's him. That's him. And he walks up to John and he says, John, baptize me. And John says, There ain't no way, Lord. I'm not worthy to baptize you. You should be baptizing me. And he says, no, John, you don't understand. You and I, you and I were made for this moment to fulfill the righteousness of God. John, do your job, I'll do my job, and both of us together will fulfill exactly what God had planned for this moment. Amen. And so John says, under this my brother Jesus profession of faith I now baptize him in the name of the Father the Son and the this is my son whoa interruption you calling in a baptism yes he got it but what happened it said and immediately when he raised Jesus up out of the water it's awesome, man, when you're baptizing somebody and they're coming back up and they just jump out of your arms. I imagine that may have been what Jesus was doing. I don't know, but I do know one thing. All of a sudden, this is my son in whom I want, please. Did you see that, angels? My son just got baptized. Really? Woo! This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Let me say something to y'all. When God speaks from heaven, ladies and gentlemen, all creation hears it. You talk about a shot heard around the world. Honey, I believe that the whole world knew that Jesus got baptized. Wherever they were at, something's going down. Because all of a sudden, Jesus is being baptized, ladies and gentlemen, and it has begun. What God had planned and put into motion, baby, it started rolling and a-rocking, and then you ain't stopping it. You get in its way and it's going to roll right over you. There was a song about that one time. They got it from this story. But have you ever, you ever made a new friend? And somebody that you liked a whole lot and, and you thought they liked you but you weren't sure. You knew that you liked them, but you really weren't sure that the, the relationship was reciprocal. Until one day you're there with them, and they introduce you. And they say, hey, I would like you to meet my best friend. And they give you a name. And then you realize, wow, yes. They do feel the same way. I don't know about y'all, but I love my God, I love my Jesus, and I love it when my Jesus says, or my God says, this is my son Chuck. Well, yeah, he's my BFF. Because we can relate now. That, ladies and gentlemen, is righteousness. Is fulfilling the purpose that God has placed you here on this earth when he thought of you when he created you when he put everything in you together for that moment of time to fulfill his work Amen. that ladies and gentlemen is righteousness we're too concerned about all of the other stuff and what we need to be concerned about is God am I pleasing you and you want to know how I know that I'm pleasing God when he says to the angels, or better yet, when he says to Satan, 
That's my son. That's my son. And let me tell you all something. When God says that is my son and my daughter, when we were singing all of the songs today, I don't know if you realize we put them together for certain reasons. You're no longer slaves. Amazing grace. We're standing. Why? Because we know now it is his amazing grace. It is no longer a slave. We've been made sons and daughters. It is awesome to hear the creator of everything stand up and say to all creation and Satan specifically, that is my child. Yes, that ladies and gentlemen should get us excited about who we are. The world's going to conquer you when you don't realize what you got. That's another song. You never realize what you got till it's gone. Problem is, God ain't leaving you. So you better just realize what you got because it's going to continue. Now, not only did God in, identify with Jesus, in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29, God also identifies with us through Jesus. He's identifying with Jesus. Now he's going to identify with us through Jesus in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. Here's what. Somewhere I'll find it. Um, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have Put on Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then what? You're Abraham's seed. Do you understand something? This, ladies and gentlemen, is the most important thing to cling to. It doesn't matter where you work, where you live. It doesn't matter where you went to school. God identifies with you and he wants you to identify completely with him as to who he is. Have you ever got a new job? And let's say, for instance, you get a job with AT&T. So you've got your cell phone and you've been paying a lot of money for this cell phone and it's through T-Mobile, Verizon, Cincinnati Bell, whoever. And all of a sudden you got a job with, with who did I say, AT&T? AT&T. I was just checking to see if y'all are listening. Some of you are all already gone to sleep on me. So anyway, what's he do? As soon as I get the job with AT&T, they say, hey, uh, you've been here long enough. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, you signed your papers. And so um, you now get free cell, cell phone service with me. Would you keep your Verizon phone? Or your T-Mobile? No, you're going to keep that AT&T phone. Why? It's free. And how in the world am I going to, somebody says to you, this is stupid. Why would you pay money for Verizon when you're working for AT&T? It's crazy. I want the benefits of AT&T. So ladies and gentlemen, if you are a child of God, then why are you still working for Satan? He doesn't have your benefits. He doesn't have your life insurance policy either. The only one that can scut your life insurance policy is God. And may I say to you all this? The life insurance policy that God has for you says, you ain't dying. You're just moving for a second. As a matter of fact, 
I'll come get you. Make sure you get here safely. Because when you die, do you ever realize that somebody's fighting over your bones? I believe there was a story in the Bible by a guy by the name of Moses who died. The story talks about the fight over the bones of Moses between God and Satan. Guess who won? So why in the world would you want to fight for a loser? I don't know about you all, but I am a competitive person. I do not like to lose. That's why I don't play games. And may I say to you this, Christianity is not a game. It is a way of life. And in this way of life, ladies and gentlemen, I don't lose. I get injured every once in a while, but in the end, guess what? The injuries go away. They're done. When we commit to following Jesus with our life, you need to understand that God calls you his child. He's already identified with Jesus. Now he's identifying with you through Christ. You see, John didn't understand why Jesus needed to be baptized. But Jesus knew that this was the way to validate my righteousness and fulfill the plans that God had for me. Why do we ask people to be baptized? It isn't to save you. It isn't, it, it was kidding with somebody the other day. Somebody came up and they looked at the baptistry and they said, man, that water is dirty. And I said, yeah, we just baptized nine people. <laughs> that was all their sins. Did mine look like that? No, we had to scrub it out three times after we baptized you, man. <laughs> but do you, under, do you understand why you're being baptized? Fulfilling the purpose of God in your life and identifying with Jesus and Jesus identifying with you. Think about it for a moment. Honestly, just think about it for a moment. I got saved. You got saved? We're children of God. Great, wonderful, we're children of God. But why did Jesus get baptized? To fulfill the righteousness of God. Why? So that now John who is baptizing, Jesus is being baptized. Now Jesus is relating with us and John is relating with Jesus who subsequently relates to God. So we have this relationship understanding through Jesus Christ. This is what it means when he says we, he has felt everything that we feel. He knows our pain. He knows our suffering. He knows what it likes, ladies and gentlemen, to be baptized and be identified with the Father. The awesomeness of that. We just don't get. But that is the righteousness. You see, a lot of people are wrecked. You're way down with anxiety, you're wrecked with fear, you're wrestling with purpose, you're racing through life, and you're barely holding on. And here's what's happening. Let me say this to you. You're barely hanging on. God doesn't want you to live in this life barely hanging on. God wants you to identify with Him. And when we identify with him, we are no longer a slave to this world. This world may get me down. This world may burden me down. This world may do all kinds of things to me. But ladies and gentlemen, we're above it. We're above it. Remember what he said? He said, you're not of this world. So quit living like it. 
Live with who you are. Understanding, ladies and gentlemen, you are a child of the living God who controls every event that ever happens. If you're going through a trial, ladies and gentlemen, God's got you. If you're going through a disease, God's got you. If you're going through wealth, God's got you. If you're going through poverty, ladies and gentlemen, God has you and will never ever let you go. We become slaves to this world because we let the world control who we are. We need to understand what it is that God wants us to do. If you ever remember having children before they ever had those little protectors that went into the electrical outlets. And you, walk, you watch your child either crawling or walking and they're wobbling over to that electrical outlet. And you keep telling them, don't touch it. Don't touch it. And the child just backs up and goes away. They never really touched it, but they never really fully understand why they couldn't touch it. Until one day when they got older and they took a plug and they plugged it in the socket and all of a sudden electricity. Now I understand why you don't want me to touch that. Because it has some power in there that could hurt me. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand that when you plug into God, he has got the energy to help you get through life. But the world keeps telling you, don't go to church, don't read your Bible, don't pray, don't listen to those people. They're looney tunes. They're, they're gun-toting, Bible-believing, right? Rednecks. <laughs> you see, Here's my question, why do we need to constantly question God's word when he rebukes us, he cautions us, he directs us closer to the Father's heart? But let me say this to you, we want salvation, but we don't want what it may cost us. You see, Matthew 16, 24 says, whoever wants to be my disciple must to deny themselves and to take up the cross and follow me. Paul writes in Galatians chapter two, verse number 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith. He says, in the son of God who, loves, who loved me and gave himself for me. It is no longer you and I living, ladies and gentlemen, it is Christ living in us. He's living, and we need to understand these are the things that he wants us to do. Number two is to understand that God loves Jesus. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. Jesus, God, not one time said, this is my son in whom I'm well placed. You need to read the Bible. He did it another time also. He said, this is my son. This is my son. Listen to him. Watch him. Do what he does. You see, when we identify with God, it makes us stronger in his love. When we identify with Jesus, it makes us stronger in understanding the love of God. There was a, a story, and let me, let me finish with this. I can't get the rest of this done because I've run out of time. There was a, a story of a missionary who loved Jesus. And so he loved Jesus so much that he felt God calling him to go to this, this tribe to witness to him. And he said, you know, I can go into this tribe and I can witness to them about Christ but I need to be able to associate with them where they're at, who they are. He was single. So here's what he did. 
he went to the chief and he says chief do you have a daughter that I can marry oh yes I got plenty of daughters that you can marry so he brought out the most beautiful daughter that he had and the missionary looked and he says don't you have another daughter he says oh yeah I, I've got one but you don't want her everybody makes fun of her the way she looks the way she acts you, 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 you don't want her he said well bring her here he did and he says that's the one I want to marry are you sure yeah that's the one I want to marry okay so they got married he goes out and he starts witnessing and for 15 years he goes and he starts witnessing to all these people and they're starting to come to Christ she's right there with him the whole time she's accepted Christ seen all of these people come to Christ 15 years later they come back home and the people that knew her said what happened did you get remarried there's something different about her her face is so beautiful she no longer walks around with her head down but now she walks around with a smile on her face and he said because you want to know why she can now identify with understanding the righteousness of God and God's plan in her life you see ladies and gentlemen the reason a lot of times we walk around so down is because we don't understand God's plan we don't know I don't know what God's going to do with you tomorrow but God does and don't wouldn't you like to find out what it was and wouldn't you like to do it when the world collapses in on you which it will we were talking this morning in the class that we're doing right now with the couples the wise man and the foolish man it said they both built their hand their, 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 they both built a house the wise man built his house on the rock the foolish man built his house on the sand they both had the same opportunity to build a house they both had the same access to the same material to build that house the problem was the location both of them experienced the storm but only one house survived the house that was built upon the rock called Jesus Christ ladies and gentlemen you me everybody in this congregation have the same access at this moment of time to be able to build on the same thing Jesus Christ the chief cornerstone the foundation if you choose to build on something else let me say what's going to happen to you your world will collapse totally and completely but if your house is built on the rock the storms may come and take the roof off of your house but ladies and gentlemen the foundation will still be there even when the house is gone when you and I die ladies and gentlemen the foundation is still here his name is Jesus Christ and guess where I'm building matter of fact I believe he said something like this I go to prepare a place for you that where I am you can be also if it were not so he said I would have told you so in my father's house are many mansions many rooms some of y'all may be 
fine with an outhouse and a half moon on it. But baby, I ain't going there. I want exactly the best that God has to offer. And guess what we get? The best. The best. That, ladies and gentlemen, is righteousness. And I hope you understand now what true righteousness is all about. True righteousness is living out the fulfillment of God in your life. What did he say? He says, I'm not, my righteousness is as filthy rags. But when he saved me, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ came in, he forgave us, now live out the righteousness of Jesus. Being obedient to the Father, that's what it is. That's all it is. See how simple, simple, but it's difficult because you have to do it down here. You can't do it later. And Satan is going to blast you. But Jesus is going to blast you off. Let's stand, would you? Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at Pastor Chuck at CalvaryBaptistMiddletown.org or you could come in and give us a phone call, if you would please, at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also invite you to come to our church and visit us, if you would please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 930 with our morning worship following at 1045. Prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, a time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups for Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting, they're fast moving, and everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving and we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have on Sunday evening, and during the school year, we have Awana, and Awana starts with the Puggles, actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at six o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night, we have a Bible study, which starts at seven. We generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us. Don't have to dress up. Just come as you are, because to us, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us, you're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time, and we hope that we have a chance to visit with you, get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you, and may God bless you.